QuickBooks Online 2024, write checks for expenses and prepaid assets. Get ready and some coffee because we're meeting the deadline with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation. Opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports on the left-hand side were in the favorites. We have the two mandatory favorites, kind of like if you had ice cream, the chocolate and vanilla are kind of like mandatory favorites and most of the other ones are basically combinations of those two. So these have to be in the favorites. We gotta right click on the balance sheet, open link in a new tab, right click on the profit and loss, otherwise known as the income statement, open link in a new tab. And then you have the trial balance, which might not be mandatory, but you can see it's kind of a combination of the other two and I think should be and I recommend to have in your favorites. We're going to open that in a new tab as well. Let's tab to the middle, close up the hamburger, and we're going to scroll up and change the range. 010124 tab, 013124 uh, tab. We will run it so we can refresh it, tabbing to the right, closing up the hamburger, scrolling up so we can run it again. Another rep on the run. 010124 tab, 013124 tab, and run. One more time, one more time. I didn't hear no bell. We're gonna push this last one out. Here we go. 010124 tab, 013124 tab. Run it to refresh it. Okay, let's go back to uh, the balance sheet here. Now we're going to be imagining it's basically the end of the month and we think about those normal type of transactions that we have to pay for at the end of the month. So typically this might happen with a check form uh, or these days with uh, an expense form. We're thinking about the normal kind of bills like the utility bill, uh, the electric bill and so on. Those that are going to be uniform or that happen very, very uh, all the time and they happen in uniform fashion basically every month. These are the types of transactions that often you might use the bank feeds for. So if I select the drop down, you'll recall our options will be if we get a bill, note that the bill that we receive has a different name than the more specific name of a bill within QuickBooks. If we get the bill from the telephone company, for example, and I enter it as a bill, that means we're increasing accounts payable and have not yet paid it. We'll pay it off at a future time with the pay bill. However, if I get a bill from the telephone company or something like that and write a check for it, then I'm not going to enter the bill as a bill form into QuickBooks, but I will simply just pay it off with the check form. The check form having a check number and will typically have a physical check. The checks are going away these days because now we have these electronic transfers, which means we have the expense form. Once again, if I get a bill from the telephone company and I pay it off, with an expense form, then I'm not entering the bill into my system as a bill form, but rather simply paying it off as it becomes due with a form similar to the check form, but with no check number, the expense form. Now, if that is the case, we're paying it with an expense form, possibly because we're just doing an electronic transfer, it's likely that we will simply wait till the check clears the bank. We will do the electronic transfer, possibly setting up the automated payments because that's just easy to do so it pays it out of our checking account automatically whenever the bill becomes due and then we set it up into our bank feeds wait till it clears the bank and then with the bank feeds we record the transaction and the form that will then be created will be the expense form 
we can also automate that process by making a bank rule to make that as easy as possible so that uh, we have as little data input needed as possible. We'll talk more about making bank rules and bank fees in a future course or section. Just want to point out that this is the most common area where the bank fees are going to be the easiest to put in place. When you're doing electronic transfers, when you're dealing with bills that are going to become due, things that you are paying for that happen on a very routine basis, like monthly, such as uh, the utility bill, and which, and which you can then set up bank rules for. Also noting that that's not the full accounting cycle when you do that, because usually what happens is we should enter the transaction on our side and then match it to the bank with a bank reconciliation, possibly with the help of the bank feeds. We're no longer doing that with the, with the electronic transfers if you're depending on the bank to record the transaction, because now you only have one person doing the transaction. We're just copying what the bank did instead of using the bank to double check us. But because we're becoming more and more confident with the bank feeds and because we don't have a long lag between the checks that we enter and when they actually hit the bank due to having to mail the checks and whatnot, it's becoming more and more efficient and we feel confident more and more uh, just entering the expense form and waiting until it clears the bank before we record it. So that's what we're going to do this time. So most of the other side of the forms, if I go to the tab to the right, we're going to decrease the checking account. The other side is going to be going into the income statement typically. Now, this is where we have the most uh, need for us to organize our account types. Because when we sell stuff, remember that we only have a few things that we sell. We sell products and services. We only have a few types of things. So we don't have a whole lot of accounts that we're going to have in the income side of things usually. But when we pay for stuff that we need in the business, we may have a whole lot of accounts. And that's where you need the most time spent organizing your accounts. Once organized, it will be very easy because then you'll have a cyclical process and you can just see what you charged that vendor to last time. Also, remember when we're making the chart of accounts, we're not going to say name the chart of accounts by vendor. I'm not going to call it like this is the Edison expense. We're going to say, no, it's the, it's the electric expense if it was Edison. If it's a telephone, I'm not going to say it's, it's Visa or AT&T. We're going to say it's a telephone expense. If you think about the bank feeds or entering the bill that you have received, it doesn't say telephone expense on it typically. Uh, it's going to say who it came from, the vendor. So when you have the bank feeds, the first, even with the bank feeds, you will have to interpret the vendor and then see what the account is that you need to charge by what you used the vendor for. Why are you paying them? What service or goods did they provide? Usually it will be some kind of expense account, but not always. So if I go to the balance sheet, you can remember that we might purchase something like fixed assets. So in that case, you know, if we used an expense form, we could see it would go on the books basically as uh, an asset type of account. Let's go to the first tab. I just want to take a look at the chart of accounts in the sale or in the transactions on the left, the chart of accounts. You will recall, we set up a new company file. And when you set up a new company file, QuickBooks gives you this massive chart of accounts because they don't customize it. As far as I can tell, they don't customize it at all to the information that you give them, such as your company type, is it a sole proprietorship partnership or a corporation and uh, the industry that you are in? Do you sell inventory or not? Is it a service business or not? That means that they give you this massive account to try to cover all of the bases. So a lot of the balance sheet accounts you might not be using because you might not need all of that detail. But, and, but remember that most of the transactions you have will decrease cash because you're going to be writing checks and the other side will go to an expense account. So how can you manage the expense accounts is usually what, what the idea would be. Well, one way you can do it is you could try to make all of these accounts inactive and then simply recreate your expense accounts as you pay off your vendors. That would be the most customized way to do it. And, and you'll end up with the, with the only the accounts that you need to use. However, a lot of people are, 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 intimidated to do that because they don't want to set up their own expense accounts. So you can use these expense accounts. If you use these expense accounts, then what you want to do, I would think, 
is to, as you pay your new vendors, you simply uh, record the expense to whatever expense account looks appropriate, whatever they provided. You're gonna have to search it out down here and find the expense account that you think is most appropriate. If it's something similar, but not exactly what you want, then you can go in here and you can edit the account. What you do not do in that case is make another account that is very similar, but not exact, because then that will lead you to end up posting things to two different accounts, which is messy. You'll have two accounts that are the same thing that you'll have to start posting stuff to. And then only when there's not anything in here that you want, will you add a new account? And that might be the case that you need sometimes. Also, if it's a sub account and you don't want it to be a sub account, then you can edit it and you can make it basically to not be a sub account. Then after one or two months, possibly three months of data input, you can go into this chart of accounts and while you have your income statement open, look at the accounts that you used and all the ones that you're not using, remove them. Why? Because if you have a whole long chart of accounts, when you do the data input, it's a lot more tedious because you have to sort through all of these accounts that are not being used. You're not using them. So that would be the plan. That's one way that you might do it. Use the accounts that they have, then trim the chart of accounts down later. After one to three months, your system should be down and you have a routine and a pretty tight uh, chart of accounts. Now, the other thing I just wanna point out is that some people really like these sub accounts. So as you're making your chart of accounts, the sub accounts are things that create a triangle. These triangles over here, let's go on the income statement, are created by account types. And then you might have other triangles that you can create yourself for a dropdown of sub accounts. Now the sub accounts can be great, but some people kind of go overboard with them. I think uh, if you put too much detail, the, the balance here will be uh, as to whether you have too many accounts, in which case your profit and loss will be too long and you'll have accounts with only like $5 in it or something like that. Uh, if, and that might be okay at some of them, but if you have a whole bunch of accounts like that and there's just too detailed, then you're getting too detailed most, most likely. And if you add a lot of sub accounts, then that's fine, but it also adds two more line items to have a parent account and then a total account. So you're gonna get a long uh, income statement if you do that. Other people, they don't add enough accounts. They just call like one account. It's, I just call it expenses. They're all just expenses. Well, <laughs> that's not very detailed either. And you're not gonna have enough information to really even make the IRS happy to record it on your taxes if you just group them into one account you know, called expenses. So you have to be somewhere in between. And note that it's not a perfect science here because, because businesses are different. People, different businesses like to group their expense accounts different ways. So uh, although there is some, uh, some kind of general rules that you, can, that you can follow. Okay, so let's do it. Let's go and open uh, a check. We're gonna do it with check forms here, even though a lot of people do it electronically these days, but I wanna still see the check form because that is what we will use with the bank reconciliation, same process as with the expense forms, except the check forms have check numbers on them. Remember, if you have a check form, you're gonna to have to actually have physical checks that you would put into the printer and use the printer to be, to be printing out the checks. You cannot print the checks on a blank piece of paper. Also, the checks are ones that you want to uh, track. You don't wanna wait till they clear before you track them because you wanna track as the question is whether they cleared or not, right? Because the bank's not gonna know about it until it clears. So let's say that we're, this one's gonna be safe insurance company. So I'm just making up a check. This we're gonna imagine is our liability insurance. So I'm just gonna tap, we're gonna make a new vendor. Notice most of the vendors, I don't need much information. So I'm just gonna say, that's it, that's all I need. I'm not gonna put a lot of detail in it unless it was a very important vendor to me, such as the people that we buy supplies from. And that if this was a bank fee transaction, this information would not be in the vendor's line, but might be in the memo line, the bank information detail line. So you can copy and paste it into the vendor line, which you really want to do because it's possible to record transactions with no vendor, but you don't wanna do that because then you lose the ability to sort your data by vendor. So let's go ahead and save it. And we're gonna say it's coming out of the checking account, tab, tab. Let's say it happened on 126, kind of the end of the month that we're writing the checks. 1007 is populating automatically. If we wanted to print all the checks together, we would say print later. 
so that we can then print all the checks at the same time, putting the checks into the uh, the, the the check the the printer to do so. All right, we have our two fields. We got the cat the category field where we're just going to assign a number to it, an account number, and the item field which we would use if we're buying inventory. So we're going to use the category field this time because we are just simply uh, paying off expense forms. Nothing special here. All right, so the account. Now, the insurance, I started off with one that's a little bit funny because if it was a telephone expense, note that you usually get the telephone bill after you, you uh, used the telephone, right? That's how they create the bill. But with insurance, by definition, by the, the nature of insurance means that you're paying for it before the coverage happens. So if you're paying for liability insurance, you have to pay for it before the coverage happens. If, if an accident happens in the future, then you have to have paid for the coverage in the past. So that means it's really a prepayment that is happening. Now, if you pay your liability insurance monthly, then you might be able to get away with just expensing it as you pay it. But a lot of times it's cheaper to pay the liability insurance by year, for example. And in that case, you're going to distort your income statement a bit if you if you record it all in one place. And, and, and just to point this out, we'll talk more about this in a future section when we talk about adjusting entries, but it's the same concept as we saw with the equipment, which is the extreme example. Meaning if you bought, uh, if you bought a building for cash of $100,000 and you just expensed it to the income statement as building expense, you would end up with a huge loss in income and it wouldn't be able to compare year to year or month to month with another month because of that loss. So that that's why you put the building on the books as an asset rather than simply expensing it, even if you basically paid cash for it. Now note with the property planting equipment, because the building is, is, is an estimate, you still have one building, or in this case, one piece of furniture, if that was one piece of furniture or equipment, that as time passes, it depreciates, it goes down in value. Because we have to estimate that, that's why you end up with this contra account. With When we talk about insurance, it's similar. Meaning when I buy the insurance, if I was to put a whole year's worth of insurance on the income statement in January and then compare January to February, then that's going to cause a problem because the insurance was is going to be consumed and is benefiting both January and February equally, even though we paid for it in January. So the idea from an accrual standpoint would be to put it on the books as prepaid uh, insurance. And, and, and then we'll, as time passes, we will write it off. Now, we don't have to estimate it like we do here. We know exactly how much of the insurance we have consumed over time, because if it's a year long coverage, we just say this is how much coverage has been consumed. Now, if you're a small business, note that you might just expense it anyways and, and try to just do it for tax purposes because that would be the easiest thing to do and just tell your tax preparer at the end of the year, whatever I need to do for, for tax purposes, this is my insurance policy, you know, do what you need to do for whatever purposes you have at the end of the year for external reporting, possibly to get a loan or something like that. Insurance is, you know, they can make an adjustment for it. Uh, or But we're gonna put it on the books as an asset so we can do the prepaid insurance because that's the typical thing you would want to do from an accrual standpoint. So if I looked here, we could we could try to find insurance, uh, insurance. And of course, they have an expense for insurance. That's the parent account, sub account, rental, business and so on. But they don't have a a asset account for insurance. So I'm going to call it prepaid insurance. I'm going to just type in prepaid insurance. Duh, duh. That's not how you spell it. You can't spell. I know I can't. I did. I'm an accountant. Okay. Prepaid. It won't let me do spell check because it wants to do the drop down insurance. Okay. Tab. And then we should set it up. So it's going to be this one is not an expense. I'm going to make it an other asset form. And we're going to say it's going to be some kind of prepayment. So it's an other asset. I'm just going to call it other long-term asset prepaid insurance. It's not going to be a sub account. That would be the triangle where you have the sub accounts and that's it. I don't really need any added description. I'll just keep it as is boom and no description. Now on the description, you might want to put like a memo that shows the period that is covered. 
so that you can say this is the this is the year that is being covered if you have that so then i'm going to say it's twelve thousand so twelve thousand for the whole year of coverage means it's going to be one thousand dollars a year we made it like even so it would and then if I was to make it billable, we would only do that if we wanted to then use this to pull over to an invoice, which isn't typically what you would do for paying the insurance. Then we, we could add a memo. We have the attachments. We can cancel, clear, print the check, order checks, make it reoccurring. We have the more options of the void. We can save and close it. We can save and new it. What's this going to do when we record it? It's a check, decrease in the checking account. Other side, not going to an expense this time but rather going to the prepaid insurance. Let's save and close it and check that out. Let's go to the balance sheet, run it again, and then we're gonna go into the checking account and check out that check. Well, let's see, there it is, there's the check, 12,000 decreasing to the checking. And notice that the bank doesn't know about that yet because it's not gonna clear the bank until they get the check. Someone, whoever, whoever has to receive it, receives it, and then they deposit it. That's why we cannot wait till it clears the bank because we need to know about it now. We have information the bank does not have. Let's go to the prepaid insurance. There's the 12,000 in prepaid insurance, which we will expense periodically using the adjusting process at the end of the month or year, which we will do in a future course or section. Let's go to the first tab. If we were tracking this internally, we can then go into the expenses if we wanted to and we can go into the expenses tab one way that we can take a look at it select the drop down and say we want to be looking at the check forms checking out the check forms there it is and we could filter the check forms if we so choose and so on and then i can go to the vendors and we could look at uh, the paid in the last 30 day that might work and then if i go down here we paid uh i don't see it there let's go back let's clear the filter and what was that who did we pay safe here it is that yeah i think it was there there it is and then we can see the detail of the check now note if we just wrote a check we don't need to go in here as often unless they have a complaint that the check got lost in the mail as opposed to if we were checking the accounts payable because then we would have to track the out track the outstanding bills and pay them at a later time all right, let's do another one. Hitting the plus button again. We're going to add a check. And this one I'm going to say is Edison. Edison. That's the electric company in the United States. So, or one of them. So we're going to say, let's save that. That's going to be the vendor. All I need is the minimal information to get the check out. And we're going to say it happened on 126. Okay, check number populating automatically. That should match the physical checks that I have, whether I print them out of the system or possibly I'm just entering, I'm just writing physical checks and tying them out to what is in the system. We still have that internal control. Now, when I look at the categories here, I want to open up the category. I'm going to right click on this tab, duplicate it, pull it to the left because I would like to see the chart of accounts because this is one I'm going to close this out. And we're going to go to the transactions, chart of accounts, closing the ham boogie. I'm going to scroll down all the way to the bottom. And then I'm going to go to the next tab. And then I'm looking for the utilities. So do, 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 electric. See, it's under utilities. Now, this is one I, where you have this question of how do you want to be recording things? This looks very detailed to me. It might be a, a perfectly fine way to do it because it would show up as a parent account of utilities and then, and then these items within the utilities. That's one way you can do it. These days, it seems to me that the telephone is, it used to be a minor expense, but now it's so large that it's i think it doesn't really fall under utilities for most people's thinking anymore i just give it its own account i wouldn't even house it under utilities anymore right the, where, and whereas the electric and the water for example uh then i might still kind of combine those together that's how i currently see things i don't put the internet under utilities personally because i feel like that's more under computer expenses i would rather have i i, I think that's like its own thing to me these days but why is it here because it's kind of connected it used to traditionally be connected to the phone line so you can see where where like you might have one line called utilities and you add all these things in it and that would be fine if these were minor expenses but you can see what has happened over time some expenses have been become major 
or some industries will have expenses that are more major. So the telephone traditionally, now like these days, I think is major for most companies, don't think of it as utilities oftentimes anymore. And, and, and again, I would think uh, the, the same could be with the internet. I would think of that as a major computer expense, not really a, a telephone type related expense. It's not even, right, it's a different thing to me these days. So I would put those into their own account. And then I usually put the, everything else, electricity into utilities. But if electricity, if I had a business where I'm growing plants or something and I have lights, I'd be consuming a lot of electricity. So I would want it in its own account if that were, if that were the case. So I'm talking here about the, the electricity. I'm just going to put it into utilities then, which currently is the parent account. Also note that if I go back on over here, you wouldn't normally post anything to the parent account. You would post to the, to the sub accounts. But I'm probably going to remove all the sub accounts and just use the parent account. I'm probably going to replace this telephone, put it into its own category and not make it a sub account. I'm going to plan on doing that later. So that's part of my adjustments that I'm going to make to their their accounts. All right, so the, the amount's gonna be 620, let's say. I'm not gonna make it billable or anything like that. What's this gonna do? Reduce the checking account. The other side's gonna go into an expense of utilities. Let's check it out. Save it, balance sheet, cash. We've got a check to check out in the checking. And so there it is, Edison bill, boom. The other time, this time goes to where it usually would go, the income statement. Go on to the income statement, otherwise known as the P&L, the profit and loss. So now we've got our expense, the utility bill, bringing down the net income. All right, let's do another one. Let's go back to, which tab am I? Let's go to this tab <laughs> and then hit the plus button. And we're gonna do another check. Another one? Yes, another one. This one's going to go to Verizon, which is a telephone company here. And we just need the name. I don't need any detail. I just need to pay these people. So we're just going to check number populating automatically. And then in the detail. So now I need to so let's check out the, the general ledger over here again for the telephone. So again, they put it under utilities. To me, doesn't sound right. I don't like calling it phone service. I'd rather call it telephone expense personally. So I'm gonna select the drop down. I'm gonna edit this one instead of adding another account that's called telephone because then I'll get confused and I'll start posting to the two accounts and that would be ugly. So let's hit the drop down and we're gonna say, let's just, I'm just gonna call this an expense. So I'm just gonna bring it up to the category of expense, not making it a subcategory. And then I'm gonna say for the tax, I won't do a tax when I'm just gonna call it telephone expense telephone expense that's a much better name porfa for the crying out loud lord porfa for the crying out loud vor por favor practice in my spanglish my spanish english they won't let me save it k for pete's sake paso here k paso k for pete's sake. i'm going to go to the tax form they need they want a tax form uh line items so i'll put it i guess under uh utilities here and then we'll save it let's save it again and then we're going to go back to the check and then this is going to be telephone telephone expense there's the one there's the one 410 we're going to say it's not billable or anything what's this going to do it's going to be decrease in the checking account the other side is going to go into the expense account of telephone expense on the income statement otherwise known as the profit and loss p l so let's go ahead and this time instead of save and close we'll check it out later and just do a save a new and we'll do another one and this one i'm going to say is staples which is a supply store so an office supply store all i need is the vendor name we're going to say it's from the checking account, same date, date, check numbers, checking out, and then down here. Now, note that the supplies is another one where we could have a similar situation where we have a prepaid situation, or we might just expense it. So, for example, if I go to the balance sheet, remember, it's the same kind of concept where you might say, well, with, with the fixed assets, if you had the building and you just expensed the building, to building expense for $100,000, it would make the income statement look like you had a huge loss in January, making it uncomparable. We saw a similar thing with the prepaid insurance, 
where we thought that it might be good to put uh, the prepaid insurance on the books because we paid for a full year's of insurance so that we didn't expense the full year in one period because then you wouldn't be able to compare period to period. You could have a similar thing with supplies. So if I bought a whole, if I bought like medical supplies, for example, and they become quite expensive, if I'm buying drugs or something that likely people are going to try to steal or things like that, you got crazy people with their eyes all, you know, whacked out trying to steal your, your drug supplies and whatnot. Well, then you're going to have to manage them uh, a little bit more closely and treat them more like inventory. So you might then put the supplies on the book books as an asset you might even track the supplies basically as inventory in that case count the supplies and then use a similar kind of flow assumption method to expense the supplies as you consume them however if you're if you're not so worried about that i mean if you if you if you're buying stuff that you know the you know the people with the crazy eyes are are not trying to get get into your supplies and break into your break into pet shops or something to steal whatever kind of medicine is in there or anything, then maybe you don't have to have as many internal controls and you can, and you could then just expense the supplies as you go. Possibly you might also think of a dollar amount, right? If you're just buying staples or something like that. And even if you're buying a year's worth of supplies, you might just simply expense them when you purchase them. That's the method that we're going to use here. We're just going to expense the supplies. Just note, if you look at textbooks, oftentimes the supplies are often used as an introduction to tracking inventory, meaning they put it on the books as a prepaid asset and then they expense them in a similar way as you would with inventory and then they go into inventory. But in practice, a lot of small businesses will simply, if it's under a certain dollar amount, record it to supplies. Now note that when you buy supplies, this staple store you might also buy, and I don't think I spelled that right, I'm sorry, but you might also buy like large things from Staples or something. And if that were the case, you might set a dollar amount to help you to determine whether or not something should be recorded as supplies or possibly a fixed asset. Because if you buy like a lot of equipment from the same store, you might categorize it as a fixed asset. If you're setting up bank rules, which we'll do in a future course or section, you can create a rule based on the dollar amount and say, hey, look, if it's above this dollar amount, I don't want you to treat it the same way. I don't, I don't want you to just expense it. I want you to possibly put it on the books as an asset. We'll talk about that later though. This time, if I type in supplies to see what QuickBooks has here, notice they have supplies and then they've got the sub account of office supplies and supplies and materials. I feel like that's redundant. So I, I think they I don't think they overdid the these these two accounts down here. I just want some generic supplies account. So I'm gonna use the parent account that they put in place and then possibly delete these two or make them inactive. So I'm gonna use the parent account and then I'm gonna say just five hundred dollars in the supplies. All right, so let's record it this time. I'm gonna say save and close. Let's check it out. Let's go to the balance sheet. We'll check out those last two transactions running the report again, going into the checking account. And then we can see down here that we've got uh, the Verizon's and, and Staples, both of those checks going out. That's what we would expect. The other side on the P&L, profit and loss income statement as expenses. So we've got the telephone expense and the supplies expense bringing down uh, the net income. So that looks good. Now. I, I mixed up the check numbers on a couple of them because I want them to be matched up to what we have on our bank uh, statement when we get to the a future course or section for the bank reconciliations. So one of them is for the Edison. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna drill down on here and show you that you can edit some transactions once entered, but you have to be careful doing this. I'm gonna go into the utilities and I'm gonna go back into this form. I wanna make that 1009 because that matches what I'm going to be doing when we get to our future uh, bank reconciliation process. So I'm going to save that one, save and close. It's going to say, you already have that one. That's okay. Cause I'm going to change the other one. So then I'm going to go back. The next one is the Verizon one, which was the telephone. So I'm going to drill down on the telephone and I'm going to go into that one. And I need that one to be according to my information here, one zero one zero. And then I'm going to say save and close. It's going to say, hey, you already have one of those. I know I'm fixing it. 
All right, then I need to change the staples one too. So I'm gonna, now I'm in the income statement. I'm gonna go into the one that went to the supplies. And this one, I'm gonna edit it. I'm gonna go into that one and make it, uh, the staples one needs to be 1008, which I don't think we have used yet because I changed it. So we'll save that. Okay, it didn't give me an error. That's good, or a double check. Let's go to the balance sheet and just check those out on the balance sheet. So I'm just gonna drill down on the checking account to check out those check numbers. So I'm gonna go down and say, okay, we've got Edison is 1009, Verizon 1010, and Staples 1008. That's the numbering that I would like to have. If you don't have it that numbering, it's okay. We'll still be able to do the bank reconciliations, but the numbers won't quite line up, which sometimes happens if there was an issue with the numbering system, but that's an internal control that we wanna look at. All right, let's go back to the internal information, back to the left. We know that if we went into the expenses tab, now we're sorting by the checks. Here's the checks that we have entered. We're not likely to have to do this as much as if we entered bills, because of course, if we entered bills, then we have to pay the bills at some future point. So if you have a cash-based system, you're paying the bills as they become due with a check instead of entering a bill form into the system, a bill form increasing the accounts payable, a check simply just decreasing the cash as the amounts that you owe become due, then you don't have as much management of the, of the vendors. If I go into the vendor side of things, then of course we can look at the uh, last paid transactions and this should give us the last paid. I tried this last time, but there's uh, Staples here and we have Verizon and Office Depot. So let's just go into Staples for an example. There's our actual check. We can look at the detail for the check drilling down on it. All right, so obviously once we have the check, the next step is it's gonna clear the bank. Once it clears the bank, it'll come in through the bank feeds if we're using bank feeds so that we can match what we entered to the bank. And that's gonna be part of the reconciliation process. Whether we use bank feeds or not, we also can do the bank reconciliation. If you use physical checks, then entering the check first is important because you need to track if it's an outstanding check. All right, so this is where we stand as of this point in time. Here's where we are with the balance sheet. It's balancing balance the sheet i can balance the sheet on my finger like a basketball because it's evenly weighted i'm going to then go to the profit and loss if it's spinning you'd have to basketball has to be anyways here's the income statement that's where we stand here's our expenses that have been input down below let's go to the trial balance to check out our numbers run it to refresh it here's where we are at if your numbers tie out to these numbers that's great if not then try changing the date range see if it's a date issue drill down on the date offender and change the date if that's the case uh, so let's just remember this is balance sheet on top of the income statement. So balance sheet, asset account, checking account, accounts receivable, asset, inventory, asset, investment, asset, payment to deposit, asset, accumulated depreciation, funny contra asset, intimately linked to the furniture and equipment account, the prepaid insurance and asset account that we set up, accounts payable, the first liability. So if the assets, one side of the coin, what do we have? The liabilities and equity, the other side of the coin. Who has claim to those assets? Third party liability people, the vendors, the bank for the visa, credit card. The government wants a piece. And then we've got the loan payable, the bank again. And then we have our claim of our own business that we, if we liquidated it, this is in theory what we would get if we scrunch it down to one number, which would be a credit. We've got the owner's investment. We got the owner's equity. We got the sale of products and then of the services, the two sales, this is the income statement, and then all of the expense accounts. Note that you're seeing a lot more debits down here. And remember that, that who has claim to it is a credit balance. Why is it a credit balance? Because the debits should outweigh the credits. And we're just telling a year's worth of the story of our business, which is a very interesting tale. I'm sure you will agree thus far. So if I add this up, 46877 plus 5180 minus 37242 minus 500 minus the 410 minus the 620. Oh, I missed up the 620. Dang it. Let's do it again. 46877 plus the 5180 minus 37242 minus 500 minus the 410 minus the 620. We get to 13285. 13285. What's matching on the bottom line of the income statement? 
back on over to the balance sheet. If we scrunch this in to one number by going to the next year, 2025, 05 to 12.31.05. We could have done it. No, not 05. What are you talking about? I don't know. I like saying 05. It sounds better. So now we're at the 13. So this has now increased to the 91, uh, eight, 181 because it added the 13 to the equity. Nothing's on the income statement. That's how the balance sheet is related to the income statement.